If you want to follow along in God's Word this evening, if you would turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, and we're just going to read the first four verses. And consider for a few moments, uh, again, the purpose of trials. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, James writes, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now we're going to go perhaps just a, a bit beyond the scope of this passage and see uh, some, of the, uh, some of the other reasons the Lord brings uh, trials into our lives besides that of endurance, although I imagine if we uh, spent some time we could see how they all fit together under that uh, particular uh, uh, category. Now last week we considered the importance of communion with God and I, I do want to keep that idea before our minds because it is something very precious. It came at a very high cost. It was something that Jesus Christ bought with his own life. So we need to uh, take it very seriously. And now that the Lord Jesus Christ has done that, it is not only our duty to commune with God, and we need to realize that it is our duty, but it is a tremendous blessing for us, uh, not the least of which is that it is the means, or perhaps the main way, that the Lord has given to us to revive our hearts, to renew our souls, and to be refreshed, and of course to grow in grace. And as we've already seen, uh, the reviving of our hearts as individuals is the main way the church is going to be revived as a whole. And the revival of the church as a whole is the way our society will be revived if it's going to be revived at all. It has to begin with the household of God. Now, in order for that to take place, again, we need to be revived individually. And to be revived individually, we must spend time with God. Uh, not only for our own good, as I've said, but also for the good of God's kingdom. We need to spend time with the Lord in daily in our private devotions. And I hope each of us here is spending time with the Lord privately reading the Word and in prayer. We need to gather as families for family worship. I hope that's a part of your household, a part of what you do as a family. As, um, let's see, I forget now the author uh, of the uh, particular book. I think mm, it was an Alexander wrote a book on uh, family worship and talked about how uh, like the, the dripping of water on a stone can eventually wear a groove into it, uh, how being daily exposed to the Word of God is going to create an impression on us and upon our children which is very, very important. It is a means of grace. It is a means of conversion as well as a means of revival. And so we need to use it. And of course we need to come to the morning and evening services on the Lord's Day not just by way of the internet, although that's very helpful when we're not able to be here, but personally, because, well, not only because it's our duty, but because it is a means of reviving us, a means of renewing us, a means of strengthening us. We're exhorted by the Lord to the author to the Hebrews to this very thing. And again, I am preaching to the choir this evening because you're here. But I'm thinking about the many who could be here who aren't here. Author to the Hebrews says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We do need to remember that at these services, the means of grace are being used, the means through which God works to build us up in the faith, to renew us, refresh us, and revive us. And the more we're exposed to these things, the more we're going to be strengthened in grace. We need to devote ourselves to prayer, of course, and, and I would again just uh, make uh, the suggestion, which I've made on numerous occasions, that coming to the midweek prayer meeting is a very good idea as far as your own personal growth and revival in grace because the Lord meets with us there to strengthen us in grace. Usually when I say that, we have lower attendance than higher. That just seems to be the way that it works, even as I've been exhorting uh, the congregation to come to the evening service, and it seems like we're thinning out rather than growing. That's, uh, it's because, of course, 
within our hearts there's a struggle and as soon as the uh, the obligation or the duty or even the blessing is set before us a reaction occurs in our hearts that resists that and that of course comes from the corruption that's in our hearts and we need to be careful of that the more as I've said we pursue these things the more our hearts will be built up the more our hearts will be revived the more we will be the means of reviving others uh, a cold and lifeless Christian doesn't have a good impact upon others as a matter of fact it gives others an excuse to cool off but those who are zealous have the, uh, the effect of creating that same kind of zeal in others which is again why the Lord wants us to gather together to encourage one another and especially as we see the day drawing near for them it was the day of the Lord of course when he brought judgment on on Israel in, in 70 AD but of course for us um, the day of the Lord could be the day that the Lord comes for us it, it, certainly the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again depending upon your eschatology it may be near it may be far but we always need to be ready we only have so much time and we I hope are seeking to do as much good as we can during that time well the more we're revived the more good we're going to be able to do our spiritual condition is the direct result of our use or non-use of the means God uses to revive us they are very important we need to use them but of course uh, we also need to recognize that when we don't use them uh, the Lord has ways of helping us to use them or I should put it another way when we don't see communion with the Lord as we ought uh, the Lord has a way of getting us to do that and of course the way he does that is by way of trial I mean when is it that we are most likely to seek after the Lord is it when things are going well or when things are going uh, hard for us uh, isn't it typically when things aren't going so well when there are things that are happening outside of our control things that uh, we that we're called upon to endure that we really don't believe we have the ability to endure isn't that when we seek communion with the Lord well this is one of the many good reasons the Lord sends trials into our lives so that we will seek communion with him it drives us to him now that's what we're going to consider this evening as we ask the question and consider the question why the Lord sends trials and we want to look at three things basically first what is a trial although I think you know pretty much what that is uh, maybe there are things going on in your lives that you don't identify as trials that perhaps you need to second why the Lord sends trials and third what we should do when he sends them okay first of all what is a trial a trial really can be any difficult situation the Lord sends into our lives and we do need to recognize that it is the Lord who sends them because God is the one who is in absolute control over everything that happens to us the Lord ordained the day of our birth the Lord has ordained the day of our death the Lord has ordained all the specific situations that we are going to have to face in life even those that we face from day to day whether they are pleasant or painful situations and the Lord has even ordained the evil that we're going to have to face in the world now one thing I just want to um, remind you of and that is that God though he is in control of all things God is not the author of evil God is not the one who created evil evil is something that came from his creatures but since God ordained that evil would arise in the world God has also ordained that he would use evil for good purposes and so God does in fact ordain all the evil that we will have to face in life he uses that which exists that which uh, has arisen from his creatures as it were uh, for good purposes in our lives each of us is going to have to face a great deal of evil uh, during our stay in this world I mean just look at the newspaper uh, as we see what's going on in our nation personally we're going to meet with many temptations there are going to be those who are going to speak evil against us uh, those who are going to steal from us those who are going to hurt us in a variety of ways and of course those that are going to cause myriads of problems for us but when those things happen we need to realize that all these things everything that's going on in our nation everything we've had to face in life is all a part of his plan 
And again, even though God is not the cause of the evil, as it were, uh, at least the primary, he is the primary cause, he ordained it, but it arose from his creatures there, the actual secondary cause, we might say of that. He does ordain these things. But we also need to understand why he ordains them, and that is he is using the evil for good purposes. And we'll see some of those in a moment. Now virtually anything, as I've said, can be a trial. It doesn't even necessarily have to be evil. Uh, and a trial is not necessarily going to be the same thing for everyone. Uh, let me do, you know, just mention a few things that perhaps uh, can connect with our children because they go through them too. For some of our children or even our youth in college, perhaps one of the subjects they're studying might be a trial for them, such as math. I often hear uh, some of our children not having a, you know, an easy time with math, and for some it is difficult, or maybe it's, it's English. And yet for others, those may not be a trial for you at all. They may be enjoyable things. Uh, for some, perhaps uh, you know, in, in a PE class, having to run a mile might be a trial, but for others they enjoy running five miles, like uh, uh, one of our uh, young men in the congregation who ran cross country, I, I'm assuming he enjoyed doing that. <laughs> it can be fun. But any situation can be a trial for us if it introduces to us some level of difficulty, something that we don't enjoy. And certainly that can be small or it can be great. And I have a number of, it looks like all my examples are great. Trouble in our marriages, certainly, is a trial. Trouble in our families at, at other levels, perhaps with our children or with you know, parents and children and so forth. Problem with our bodies, the physical ailments that we go through. Problems with our finances. Alienation, of course, from people we care about. The loss of loved ones, that certainly is a great trial. The spiritual crises that we're going to have to face in life, especially struggles with assurance. Am I a Christian or am I not a Christian? In short, of course, anything that causes uncertainty, pain, grief, suffering, fear, anxiety, things that push us out of our comfort zone, any of those things can qualify as a trial. So trials can be any number of things. They can be small, they can be great, they can be things that are evil, they may be things that are not evil, but they are things that in one way or another cause us some degree of discomfort now the second question is, why does God send trials? Of course, he does it for good purposes, and we've already seen one of them. It's to cause us to seek after the Lord. Remember, we saw at the beginning, the Lord saved us so that we might have communion with him through the Lord Jesus Christ. When we don't come on our own, the Lord will send things that will change our direction and drive us to him. And by the way, that's a, that's a good thing. It may not be the easiest path to take, but the Lord loves us. And He wants what is best for us. And what is best for us is to have communion with Him rather than not to have communion with Him. And so the Lord sends trials to drive us to Him. If, if we would only be able better to subdue our sinful desires that would keep us away from the Lord and come to Him more often and be faithful in our communion with Him, He may not have to send so many trials to bring this about. I, I think what we do has an effect on the number of trials that we're going to have to face in this life. But now that isn't the only reason. Another reason that the Lord brings trials, and, and this is something that is, is also very good, all these purposes are good, is to remind us that the world in which we live is not the final destination, is not our permanent home. And that's something we need to be reminded of again and again. Sometimes we get confused. Sometimes we forget that heaven exists. Sometimes we think that life is what we need to hold on to here and we need to get all of our enjoyment and pleasure in this life rather than in the life that is to come primarily. Now this misunderstanding, misconception, ignorance perhaps on our part, is one of the things that communion with God will correct because the more time we spend with Him the more our hearts will be detached from this world and attached to that world which is to come. When we neglect that communion and we begin to lose sight of that goal of heaven the Lord will remind us through the many trials that we will have to face 
after a while you go through so much suffering in this life and you say, you know, I've had enough of this, I want heaven. When things are going well, it, it just seems to be the opposite. You want to stay here and you don't want to go to heaven. So you can see that, that good effect. Now, I'd like to read for you a, um, a passage from Jeremiah Burroughs, who was one of the uh, Puritans uh, of the uh, 17th century, one of the nonconformists, I believe, and um, independents. And he, he talks about the fact that we shouldn't be looking for our happiness in this world, and God actually makes it unpleasant in several different ways so that our hearts won't be attached to the world, but rather attached to heaven. This is what he says. God, says Bernard, has not cast us out of paradise to seek another paradise in this world. I should mention that those who are at the prayer meeting have already heard this, so if you recognize it, that's where you heard it. He hasn't cast us out of paradise to seek another paradise in this world. No, we are born to labor. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you seek for living comforts when you must expect to die daily? It is only heaven that is above all winds, storms, and tempests. Rest must come after labor. Our rest is the crown of our labor. To seek it here is to seek it preposterously or absurdly or in a contradictory way. Why do you require that in one place, says Ambrose, which is due in another? Why would you absurdly have the crown before you have overcome? Imagine the most settled condition you can in this world, and even if you had it, yet it would be but vanity. So says the psalmist in Psalm 39.5, man in his best estate is vanity. The original is, in his settled estate, he is vanity. Not only vain, but vanity itself. It was a heavy charge that St. James laid upon some in James chapter 5, that they loved... Uh, they, that they lived in pleasure upon the earth. It is as if he said that earth is not the place for pleasure. This is the place of sorrow or trouble, mourning and affliction. Thus Abraham charged Dives in that parable of the rich man and Lazarus. In your lifetime, he said, you had your pleasure. The emphasis lies there in your lifetime. That should not have been the time. Let us take heed that we be not too hasty in seeking our rest, pleasure, and delight. We may perhaps have a little for a while to the flesh. And because we will not be content with that condition that God has appointed for his people, here we may lose our part in that glorious eternal rest which God has prepared for his people hereafter. Seek for that which you do, namely for rest, but do not seek it or for it where you do. If we seek our rest in this world, even though we meet with so many troubles in it, what would we do if the Lord should let us prosper? Behold, says an ancient writer, the world is troublesome, and yet it is loved. What would it be if it were peaceable? You embrace it, though it is filthy. What would you do if it were beautiful? If you could not keep your hands from the thorns, how earnest, or if you, I guess if you could keep your hands from the thorns, how earnest would you be in gathering the flowers? The Lord, as it were, then puts thorns in the things of the world so that when we embrace them, we get stung by them, so that we will not love this world. If God took away the thorns, how much would we hold on to it? Now, the idea again is that God wants to show us or remind us that this world is not our rest, this is not our reward, this is not our final destination. And so the Lord brings trials into our lives. He brings this, this suffering, this mourning, this affliction. One of the reasons he does that is to remind us that that is the case. Heaven is the place of rest. Heaven is the place of enjoyment. And we need to remember that. Now James gives to us still one more important reason the Lord brings trials. And that is to test the character of our faith as to its genuineness. What kind of faith do we actually have? Do we have a saving faith? You know, he gets into that, of course, in James chapter 2. The faith without works is dead. Do you have a working faith? Or do you have merely an historical faith like that of the demons? They believe God is one and they tremble. But do they have anything more than that? Are they trusting in the Lord Jesus? Well, certainly the demons aren't. But the question is, are you? 
And the Lord brings trials for that very purpose, to show us the character of our faith, whether we believe the facts or whether we're actually trusting in Jesus. Because those who merely believe the facts are like, of course, the uh, stony ground hearers that uh, when the, uh, the faith, as it were, springs up and seems to be lively and seems to show promise of a great deal of fruit, suddenly a trial comes along and it withers. And of course, also that seed that fell among the thorns, where the cares of the world grow up around it and choke it out and it bears no fruit. What kind of faith do we have? And is it going to endure the trials that are in this life? Well, those, uh, that, those who have the faith that endures shows itself to be genuine faith. And then if you are genuinely converted, whether or not your faith is strong enough to trust God in those difficult situations, or whether it's a weak and fragile faith that is in need of strengthening. You see, trials will show what our faith is really like. It'll show the character of our faith. And remember also something that Greg has already uh, reminded us of this evening. Does God send these trials to show him what our faith is like? Or are these trials sent to show us what our faith is like? Well, we need to realize that the trials are not for God's benefit, but the trials are for our benefit. Because God already knows what we are like before he sends the trial. Uh, God knows all things from all eternity, precisely and perfectly, everything about us, everything that could possibly be true about us. He, know what, he knows what we're going to do when he sends the particular trials that he's going to send. He knows what we would do if he sent other trials which he's not intending to send. Uh, we have many examples in Scripture where the Lord knows what would happen under any given set of circumstances. Remember when uh, Paul prayed to the Lord regarding the, the ship in, and how it was in the storm and so forth and what happens if these men leave the ship? Well, if the men leave the ship, you're all going to die. But if the men stay in the ship, you're all going to live. Or David, when he was in that particular city that um, he had just delivered from attack from the enemies, and, and then he heard that Saul was coming after him, and he says, Lord, if I stay here, will the leaders of the city hand me over to Saul? And the Lord says, yes, he will, or they will. And so David leaves. And that person's never given the opportunity to hand David over, but that's what he would have done if David had stayed there. God knows, of course, all things. He doesn't need to send the trial for his own benefit. But he sends them to show us what we will do under those particular situations. Because up until the time of the trial, we don't know. We don't really know our hearts. We really don't know our character. We don't know what we can endure and what we can't endure or what it is we're going to do when we're faced with those things. Let me give you one uh, sterling example from Scripture. When Jesus told Peter that he was going to deny him three times that night, uh, the night of his betrayal, Peter didn't believe him. Uh, Peter thought he was better than that, right? He thought he was stronger. He thought he was willing to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll never deny you. He says, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing too. Uh, but Peter was wrong, wasn't he? He was wrong about his character. He was wrong about his resolve. When it came down to it, he denied Jesus three times. The disciples were also incorrect about their resolve and their strength. Uh, when put to it, they all ran away and left Jesus alone. They thought they were better than that. But, but they were wrong. And it was the trial that showed them. Now, whether we realize it or not, the Lord is constantly bringing trials into our lives to test us and to show us what we're like. And sometimes we don't recognize them because we think that trials are only big things, uh, catastrophic uh, crises or situations. But we need to realize that they also are small things that the Lord brings. As a matter of fact, even no trial can be a trial. We can put it that way. A smooth sailing. Because it's at times like this that we are tempted not to seek after the Lord. So even prosperity can be a trial for us. So trials, uh, again, can be just about anything, but they are given for very important reasons. To drive us to communion with God. To remind us that this is not the final destination. And also, of course, to test the character of our faith. What kind of faith do we have? The Lord is constantly 
uh, challenging us. Now finally, what should we do when God sends a trial? Well, in general, James says, rejoice. Verse 2, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. I mean, isn't that what we do every time we're faced with a trial? Don't we rejoice? Well, actually, we don't. I think uh, we would if we understood better God's methods because God has a good purpose behind these things, and that's why we should rejoice. God is helping us through these trials. He's working out something good. He's giving us reasons, as I've already said, to seek communion with Him, and that's a good thing, the fact that we do it rather than not doing it. He is reminding us that this world isn't our permanent home so that we'll seek the things above, and that's good. And he is also testing our faith to strengthen our assurance, to build up our endurance, to help us overcome our sins, all of which are very good things. The Lord is training us. That's what trials are all about. And he is preparing us for heaven. But while we're here, he is training us so that we will be stronger, so that we will have more endurance. And you'll find, typically, that the Lord is going to test you, because that's what a trial is, is a test, again, to show you your, your weaknesses so that you'll be stronger. He's going to test us in our weakest areas until we overcome those weaknesses, until we become stronger. And, of course, once we do become stronger in that particular area, the test will end there and they'll start up somewhere else <laughs> because we're not going to actually achieve or become what it is we ought to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, too, that the Lord may not just work on one area in our lives, but probably work on several. Uh, I, need to, I think we all need to put this into, um, you know, apply this to our lives, but if you get frustrated like I do, like catching so many red lights when you're... Uh, on your way trying to get somewhere, you're going to catch a lot of red lights until you learn to deal with them in a righteous way. Uh, the Lord is going to help us. Okay? He's going to bring these trials. It's a part of His training regimen. And we, we need to know each time that we are faced with these kinds of situations that the Lord is putting our faith to the test. Unless our faith is tested, unless it is challenged, Unless it is stretched, sometimes to the very limit, it's not going to grow any stronger. Uh, this applies to virtually every area in life. I mean, athletes, they know that if they want their muscles to grow stronger, they have to be pushed to their limit. Otherwise, as long as they're in their comfort zone and they don't need to be any different than they are to do the work they're doing, they're not going to change. They need to be challenged. A runner's not going to run any faster unless he pushes his limits all the time. The long distance runner is not going to be able to run any further unless he pushes again the limits of his endurance to the very end so that the body responds and grows stronger. In your understanding, in your minds, as far as your mental abilities, unless you challenge them and, and push their limits, you're not going to gain any more knowledge. You're not going to gain any more endurance in your ability to study or uh, to learn. In the same way, the Lord pushes the limits of our faith to cause it to grow stronger and to increase in endurance. So basically the same principle applied to faith. So the bottom line is don't resent the trials that the Lord brings into your lives because everything the Lord does is good and if you're his child he does it for your good so that you will learn, so that you will grow, so that your strength and endurance will grow. You will grow in grace. You'll become more like the Lord. And by doing so, of course, you will be more useful to Him. You'll be more useful to others. You'll be a means of reviving others, as well as, of course, reviving yourself. The Lord wants you to spend more time with Him, to grow strong in Him, and these things are a way in which He does it. So don't resent the trials, but rather know what it is that God is doing through them and learn to cooperate with God in that trial to grow in those areas that he wants you to grow in. Well, let's spend a few moments in prayer and let's ask the Lord to show us um, those areas he wants us to grow in.